Hi there, Lars Hammer here. I am the pastor at Lord of Grace Lutheran Church here in Marana, Arizona. Welcome back to the Walk Through the Psalms, uh, short little Bible study devotions where I look at some passages of the Psalms, uh, we read through them, and then I'll give some reflections on what the text is saying and a little bit of what I think it's saying for us today. Some thoughts for you to reflect on and think about as we go through the book of Psalms, which is a wonderful book because it deals with the voices of people, uh, dealing with real life struggles, uh, dealing with hardships, dealing with heartache, and turning to God when things aren't going well, uh, and turning to God when they're suffering, and it shouldn't be, and, it isn't, and life isn't fair. So the Bible is full of people who wrestle, wrestle and struggle with their faith. The Psalms are full of that too, so I hope you'll find uh, some, some comfort, some inspiration, uh, some sense of, uh, God's presence in your life as we go through this. So let's take a look. We're gonna keep going on Psalm 69, and uh, we're gonna start at verse 30. We're gonna do verses 30 through 36. I will read through the Psalm, and then uh, we'll look at it, kind of break it down verse by verse. So here we go. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. Let the oppressed see it and be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own that are in bonds. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah, and his servants shall live there and possess it. The children of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall live in it. This psalm, just a quick two, the two second background is that the verses preceding this, the verses coming up to this one, are a long lament about a person being shamed, cast out, oppressed. It's kind of a long, misery, a long list of misery and a plea to God to listen in the misery. And this is where it picks up. So after all this long prayer about God hear me, my life is tough, God hear me, my life is tough, now the psalmist switches. Now we're gonna switch to praising God. That's an interesting contrast. I know it's miserable, hear my prayer, but I'm still gonna praise God. So let's, let's start out, verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. That's almost like a refrain. You could almost hear that as a refrain. A lot of the Psalms, we think, were sung, somehow sung. That makes a great refrain, doesn't it? Could you hear the praise song? I'll praise the Lord with a song. I'll magnify with thanksgiving. I'll praise the Lord with a song. So you could see that going on. Um, and so, this is kind of set up. Is this a self-contained part of the psalm? Like a different verse that they kind of patched in? Eh, maybe. Uh, we'll never know for certain. But, so God is praising the Lord, right? I'll praise the Lord more. And uh, verse 31, this will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. What's this all about? The Lord's gonna be happier with my singing than with an ox? What's the ox doing? It's out on the farm pulling the, what, plow? No, this is animal sacrifices. This is saying, my song of praise, a song that I give to God, will please God more than if I took that ox off the farm and went to the temple and killed it and burned it as a sacrifice to God. This is stepping into that debate that is all through the Old Testament, that speaking in generalities, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah, the law, that's what they're called, those five books are huge into animal sacrifices. If you sin, if you err against God, take one of your animals, kill it on, give it to the priests, have it killed on the altar. It's a way of saying, I have sinned, I've done wrong, and I'm going to show it. 
I'm going to give up something that's very valuable to me to God to sort of demonstrate that I'm not just saying, oopsie, sorry, and I'm going to go back and do it again. There was a real purpose to the animal sacrifice. It had a sliding scale as well. So if you were wealthy, it was an oxen. If you were the king, it was lots of oxen and bulls. It, and it went down to sheep, goats. You could even do doves and pigeons. So if you were homeless and on the street, you could capture that pigeon and sacrifice it. So it was kind of set up based on your income, but that was still the idea. The problem always was, especially for people who were wealthy, is they would go out and do whatever they wanted, sin freely, and then, uh, you know, sin all weekend, and then on Monday morning, bring in a bull and go, hey, and go, all right, high priest, uh, sacrifice my bull, oopsie God, sorry. The bull gets slaughtered, burned on fire, and the belief was that God would smell the meat and be pleased, uh, that God likes a good cookout, right? But this is the psalmist, and not just in this psalm, but pretty much through all the psalms, the view is very consistent. God is not interested in the animal sacrifices. God wants your praise and your change in behavior. And that's very much the view that the prophets will take. So the first five books, yay animal sacrifices. The prophets in the Psalms, no animal sacrifices, change the way you live, change your heart, change your behavior. And that tension is a tension that will go all the way through into Jesus. And Jesus will end up falling down pretty solidly on the side of the prophets and the Psalms in saying, you know, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So there's a lot in that verse. You or I might not notice that or see that as much. But this is what he's saying. So I'm going to praise the Lord. I sing, 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 praise the Lord. Um, and this will please you. This will please you more than an ox or a bull, right? More than the most expensive sacrifice I could give. A sacrifice of praise is the best sacrifice, right? Now that he's offered that, now what's the plea? What does he say? He, what does he ask God for? Let the oppressed see it and be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise those that are in bonds. Okay, so the intended audience of this is not let the successful revel in their success and know that they're really great people. It's let the oppressed see it and be glad. This psalm, this message is for those who are oppressed. There's a bunch of layers to this. One is, yes, it is expensive to run those animal sacrifices, and even hunting down doves and pigeons carries a time and an energy and an effort. You gotta get to the temple and you gotta get it sacrificed. So there's an expense that makes it hard for the oppressed to do, right? But the other part of it is that God is, again, God is not the God of the victor and the conqueror, God is the God of the oppressed. So God is the God of losers, not winners. And God sees the losers, and God's word is intended as a good word, an inspiring word, a hopeful word to those who are oppressed. Remember that Jesus, when he starts out his ministry, opens up the book of Isaiah and reads a verse about letting the oppressed about good news to the oppressed and releasing the captives. He reads the prophet Isaiah. This is exactly what Jesus' message is. This is good news to the oppressed. And that word, you know, I get it. It's a, we struggle with it in America. Latin America doesn't struggle with this word. Actually, a lot of the world doesn't struggle with this word. Because in most of the world, people understand that the way money and power operate is that it's not a free-flowing thing where anyone who just works hard enough and makes the right combination of decisions can be rich and famous. In most of the world, even in a large part of the US, wealth is a function of how you're born, your family, your connections, your inheritance. 
Poverty is a function of how you're born. And those who have money and power will do what they need to do to keep their money and power and grow their money and power. And that will often involve abusing, exploiting, mistreating somebody who was born without the money and power they had. And that's honestly how most of the world were, has worked in most of human history. And most advanced societies that have structures, uh, that have hierarchies, are oppressive structures. And that's just the nature of it. And I know, and again, in the US, we kind of, we get a little squeamish talking about oppression in this way. You know, the, the sort of myth that anyone can, anyone can achieve anything with the right amount of hard work and good decisions um, runs in the, you know, the idea that there is oppression and that God is on the side of the oppressed, that tend to us, you know, we, that gets sort of class warfare and we get nervous talking in those terms. The Bible isn't supporting Marxism. It's simply saying that the world is intrinsically unfair and a lot of people are suffering, not because they did anything wrong, but because somebody with wealth and power is making them suffer. Give the example of the mine. The mine in, say, Bolivia, Peru, right? Th those are very, very mineral rich areas. And, the, and there are towns, you can go look at it, you can go look this up, uh, where there are mines and they'll dig out these precious metals and the workers are paid so incredibly little. They are worked all day long, no safety conditions, worked to the bone, paid just enough to keep them from starving to death and they get home from all their hard work and live in a tiny little shack and the water they drink is polluted by the runoff of the mine they work. They're not suffering because they're making stupid decisions. They're not suffering because they're immoral. They're oppressed because somebody with wealth and power owns that mine and has decided to pay them less money and treat them worse so that he can make more money himself. And the government has decided not to make it a law to force the person with wealth and power to increase wages, to increase worker conditions, to increase environmental protections. It's a systemic issue. It's not a personal morality issue. The person got the mine because they inherited the mine, usually. It's, it's pretty rare, even if you look at a, a history of American mines, for somebody to go out find the mineral, stake the claim, and then develop the mine. What usually happens is they stake the claim and then somebody else steals, the, steals it from them or kills them and takes the papers or some big conglomerate comes out because, you know, Joe Schmo Prospector with his little pan doesn't have the kind of money to build gigantic processing plants. And so then he sells out, he gets a small cash payment and some guy who inherited money, who had the money in the first place to buy him out, then it uses the inherited money to build the processing mill and turn that into more money. That's just how the system works. People are oppressed. Oppression is real. Oppression happens. People are poor and suffering because people with wealth and power make them poor and suffering. And where does God step into this? I don't think the Bible says there's nothing we can do about our fate. We are purely uh, slaves to circumstance, although for a lot of people in our world, that is very much the case. Um, even in American history, that has been quite literally the case, right? Uh, but where's God in all this? God is not lecturing the oppressed and telling them that it's their fault. God steps in and is the one who gives good news to the oppressed, gives good news that they can be glad so that when they seek God, their hearts revive. Why? Because God is with me. God is present with me. God hears my prayers. God listens to me. How do we know? It says that right in verse 33. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own that are in bonds. Right? Because I, in our world, one of the cruel ironies is that not only do a lot of people suffer because of the way systems are set up, but then they get looked down upon and despised. Right? How many people make fun of homeless people? 
I mean, that's got to be one of the just the most, well, you got to find good words that I can use on a church podcast, but one of the meanest, callousest things you can do is to, is, to, is to be mean and cruel to someone who's homeless. It's like they're already struggling in life and you're going to make it worse. But we do. We despise them, right? We see them and then what's our thought? Get them off the street. Get them out of our neighborhood. Get them out of my way. Instead of, oh, this is a hurting person. How can we restructure things so that everyone has full employment and health care and housing? No, 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 no. We despise them. And this is what happens. What does God say? God does not despise his own that are in bonds. So those who follow the Lord, who are oppressed, who are struggling, God is listening to you. God does not hate you. You may think that God hates you because if God loved me, would he put me in this circumstance? But the psalmist says, no, God does not hate you. God does not despise those who are in bonds. And then he finishes up with some more praise. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save and rebuild the cities of Judah. So there he goes now. That now it kind of switches. I'm not even sure why that last part is in there. It switches to God's going to rebuild Jerusalem again. And it, a lot of Psalms end with that. So sort of through all our struggles, what's going to be the end? God's going to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, in the New Testament, how does it end? God rebuilds Jerusalem. God makes a new Jerusalem uh, that comes down out of heaven. But God rebuilds Jerusalem. So through all the suffering, what's going to be the solution? The solution is that God's going to make a new city. It's God's laws, God's way. And there will be no more oppression in it. God hears, again, for, let's say, God... Uh, hears the needy and does not despise those who are in bonds. Uh, remember that. Uh, what a wonderful God we have who sides with the oppressed and those in bondage uh, and does not despise but listens to them. All right, thanks for tuning in. I hope you guys have a great day. I hope it's been uh, helpful for you. And um, we'll see you next time. God bless.